so uh, that I asked you to participate in a survey that I'm now closing up your assignment, that the entire group that I wish to examine, is that all students taking 1206 this term? Could be, that's all that were invited to participate in it. Or did I wanna talk about all students in their first year or all business students in first year or all students at St. Mary's? Whatever that group is that I wanted to examine and be able to talk about is called a population. The group that I actually collect data on is known as a sample. So those of you that participated, you would be my sample. And it's so it's the ones I actually have data on. The population is the group I'd like to talk about. Data set, that's the data that's in my sample. And a cross-textual chart, I don't know what that is. I just made that up. So in class, we'd get all the responses and you'd see lots of people would get wrong answers. And we get to talk about that. So you're not alone. Don't expect to get things perfect. Data measurement scales do not include which of the following? Ratio data, interval data, synthetic data, or ordinal data. Generally, we classify things into four categories. There's two big categories, one called categories <laughs> and the other one called new categorical data and the other one called numeric data. In categorical data, we have things like nominal data, what your gender is, uh, what program you're studying, what city you live in, it's just a word. But if those words are in a sequence like are you very dissatisfied, dissatisfied, neutral, satisfied, very satisfied? Those are all words. That's like nominal data, but there's a sequence to them from lowest to highest. The grade you get in this course ranges anywhere from an F, hopefully not, to an A+, plus, which would be good. Uh, those are all words. They're from failing performance to excellent or outstanding performance. So those are ordinal because there's a sequence, there's an order to them. With numeric things, we start out with intervals, interval data. Common example is uh, the temperature. Uh, that another sort might be a date. That um, what day of the year it is that what week of the year it is, there's a sequence to those things, but they're actually numbers that we can actually operate with because I could talk about the difference between two dates, between the first of the month and the, the first week of the month and the last week of the month, there's four weeks in there. So you, you can take, you can do subtraction and addition, but you can't take ratios of interval data. I can't take the ratio of temperatures but I can look at differences uh, that I could look at mm, averages with generally with interval data. I could look at average temperature. Ratio data is ones where it makes sense to talk of percentage change of ratios. So if it's 10% more than it was before, then it's ratio data because you're taking the ratio of things. That, uh, synthetic data? No, that's not one of the scales. And here's a third one. So data quality issues include coding errors, missing data, duplicate data, all of the above. That all of those things are, if there are errors in the coding, of course, that affects quality. If there's missing data, that's a quality problem. I have missing information. If I have duplicate data, Again, that's a problem because I'm double counting individuals. So that can affect the quality of my data. There are lots of different sources of problems with my data. And so all of the above is correct. Hopefully that helps. But in class, again, I'd be asking these, and these are relatively easy ones. I said your first test is relatively easy. So this class should be on the 23rd. Um, that looking at what is the holiday or special about uh, the
the 23rd. The only thing interesting, uh, snow plow mailbox hockey day. It's becoming less common now as uh, we don't get door-to-door -door delivery like we used to, at least in some locations. But we used to, if you lived in a rural area, always complain about the snow plows that plowed over your mailbox. You have to replace it on a regular basis. That um, anyway, I didn't know there was a, na a day named after that. But uh, there's a workshop on Monday you might be interested in on how to do focus, concentration, that type of thing. Any suggestions on how you can do that? It may be a good workshop for you, it may not be. Uh, it's worth looking at anyway to try to get ideas because. Uh, Many of us have difficulty with our concentration and focus, get easily distracted, like my dog. <laughs> um, another one, I'm not sure about, there's the alcohol and sexual violence is an important issue and th there's a relationship between the two and getting out partying and problems that happens. I'm hoping they spend a lot of time talking about bystander training Bystander training is really important. It's when things aren't happening to you, but to others, that when you see behavior that's inappropriate, people saying things that are just, no, you don't say that kind of thing, uh, they'll continue doing it unless someone calls them on it. And uh, if you see bullying going on, all kinds of things that if you don't, if you leave it alone, then you're almost condoning that type of behavior. And a lot of the problems we have in society come because, oh, that's not my problem, or I don't want to get involved. That you, you don't want to put yourself in a risky situation. You don't want to get beat up because you called someone on something. Uh, so no, not asking you to do that type of thing. Sometimes it's, it's appropriate to speak up, other times, maybe you need to voice it to someone else, raise it with uh, some office or someone that you feel it's appropriate to let them know this is going on, that uh, just don't condone it. And unfortunately, a lot of bad behaviors we condone and we let people get away with it. And so they do. Just something to think about. So let's get into the meat of what we need to do. That Last day, we did some basic things in Excel of setting up our data, preparing it, um, that we used a few functions for doing that. And that from a data science perspective, it was things about making sure you know what your data means, that you've got a dictionary and you understand your dictionary. You protect it because copy your data, don't mess with the original file the original away elsewhere. We also observed some basic data quality issues and we'll see more of them as we go through the next few classes analyzing this data. That um, the work we did initially was preparing it, make it easier to understand. Now we'll just start exploring it. And this is part of the data preparation in some is cases. And others will think of it as more into data understanding, understanding what your data is. So we'll start working through some of those basic sorts of things here today. Okay. That, let's get going. So we're going to focus on just looking at one variable at a time. We've got several variables. We'll look at relationships and that sort of thing soon. But uh, let's start looking at them one by one and uh, what's big, what's small, what's the middle, those types of basic things. So we can start out um, doing sorts of things, some basic sorts of things like sorting or filtering our data. So if we go in and look at what programs they're in, maybe we want to just look at business students. So if you click on the down arrow for program, we can check off which ones we want to look at. And we can also use certain text filters with it that or numeric things we can use number filters and we'll do that in just a minute so if i just pick business students 
my sheep will suddenly only have programs being business and will drop everything else out of there. That this one here, I've also sorted on home and I clicked on outside of Canada. So students that work international and you may not be able to see it over on the far right, I clicked on gender and I looked only at female. That uh, the, I can also, I've filtered on start and it's only those that started in 2009. Those were new students. The survey was in the winter of 2010. You'll notice with each of the ones that I filtered on, there's like a funnel. Instead of an arrow pointing down, there's a funnel pointing down. So with some of these other ones, you'll notice it's just a triangle arrow. But if you zoom in, you'll see with start and program and home and over here on gender, it's a funnel. So it's a reminder that you've done filtering. I wish they put it in color <laughs> because I find it hard to see. Um, maybe it's just my age, but I forget I've got filters on. We can also do number filters that are more complicated. If you click on a number like salary that you get, it says number filter here. If you remember before it had text filters and it lists all the different numbers. So I could click off the ones I don't want to see or because some of the numbers are crazy that uh, what I can do is click on this number filters thing and just select those that are over something or between something and see it says number filters equals does not equal greater than greater than or equal to less than less is between uh, it's in the top 10 it's above average below average lots of different choices that we can click on so it's a really powerful tool to pick subsets but it's remembering to take the filters off and I forget that frequently, that I can also sort my data and that I could do, if you look before it, with numbers, I could sort from smallest to largest or largest to smallest. When I had words, if I clicked on it, I could sort alphabetically, A to Z or Z to A, or this funny one called sort by color. What do they mean by that? Well, let's sort by color. It's a custom sort. If you click on sort by color, it has a choice being custom sort. And so with these ones, you will see smallest to largest. We'll try custom sort in a minute that I did smallest to largest and we'll find some strange numbers. You'll see some really low ones. We can see that just in the list here. They're strange because why would someone expect to earn only $5,000 or only 9,000? But this one said 9,450. And on the high end, we've got someone that expects to earn 650,000 or someone 560,000. You could have seen that by scrolling down this list, but also by doing the sort. So we've probably got data entry errors that we've got a number that are blank, that um, the uh, with some of the data entry errors, like the 500, maybe that should have been 50,000, but they coded it incorrect, incorrectly. Maybe they thought it's how much did you expect to earn per week? Something, I'm not sure. Um, that maybe they misinterpreted the question, or maybe they were just messing with us, giving us crazy numbers. That the, uh, in class, we do anonymous discussions in Top Hat, so they can type in things, comments, that sort of thing during class. And that uh, it's not uncommon for them to put in crazy things um, just to mess with me. Yesterday, it was, or Wednesday, uh, someone said, blame it on the communists. What, what's that got to do with anything? And just messing with us. So the other thing, and we'll get to this, is we can also summarize our data 
by putting in what we call a table row. And at the table row, we're going to be able to do a bunch of fun things with. So let me just, whoops, I've hopefully have it popped out of my presentation altogether. Let me go back here. I don't want to, I want to write these controls again. So, whoops. It's not what I want to see. Yeah, I don't want to see that either. Excuse me. Oh, no, now I'm out of my presentation. Oh, well, I just want to get to Excel. Here's my spreadsheet behind these controls. I'll never figure out all these different things that are here. So here was my data set. And here were some of the things I was doing. I went to program, I clicked on it. I went down and said, no, I'm not going to select all. I just want business, clicked OK. And boom, it changed. I just had business. That um, if I wanted to, I could go over here and look at age. And I could say, well, who's the oldest student? Let's sort them largest to smallest. And age, well, in this data set, the, the oldest was 25. I suspect there were constraints on what you could type in. And 25 was the oldest. Look how many I've got that are 25, 24, so on. I should have students that are older than that. And you'll see at the smallest end that the youngest students, I scrolled through, were 17. Hmm. I've had students as young as 16. I'm surprised that I can uh, go and look. I could look at that salary one. I could say, I'd like to know. So I've got number filters. I'm going to, I want ones that gave me figures that are between, uh, say, 30,000 and 100,000 to take out the crazy numbers. Now you'll notice I don't put any commas in here. Don't put commas in, Excel won't like it. Okay, just numbers. And this now you'll see, I don't have really, really low numbers that I had before or really big numbers, okay? And I could take it off. I can clear the filter and then it's back. And here I've got crazy numbers like 4,000 here or um, do, 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 do. I have some strange ones in here, maybe not. Oh, I've got other filters on, that's why. That, oops, because I'm looking at business students. So my crazy numbers, and again, I can clear the filter. There, here's a crazy student in arts that wanted to earn 450,000. So there are lots of fun things you can do. Right now I'm in, I've got, if you look at the top here, you'll see there's a darkened one. It has table tools, tools that are only for use in a table. And one of them says design, so click on it. And this one, generally the default is to have no total row, okay? It has banded rows, I can take that out if I want, and it won't do that in a sense. Um, Sort of it did and it didn't, not sure what it did there. Um, a total row and a header row. So let me click on total row and it'll throw me right to the bottom. Now it actually, it's got a lot of stuff in here because I typed stuff in there in the before. But this is your normal total row, it should be blank. And if you click on a cell, you get a down arrow. So on ID, I can click on it. And it can give me a bunch of different functions and more functions if I want. That I'm not going to average IDs. I could count them though. Ah, there are 811 students answered the survey. Let's go to start. What do I have here? How many? My count 802. So only 802 told me what year they started their program. That what about? over here on home. How many told me where they were from? 
801. Oh, okay. I recoded that. How many do I have here? Should be the same, right? No, oops. Count. Excuse me, I asked for average. 811. Why? Well, you can see it right here. See that blank for home? It recoded it as not applicable. So actually, it put a value in there. Same thing is going to happen here. Uh, how many told me the salary expectations? 752. I categorize them. You can see here, this one left it blank. We have that problem we had before. It changed the blank into a value. So I get 811. What about gender? That one, we fix the blanks. So how many told us gender? 665. That's not very many. Think about that in a minute. Uh, but I recoded it and I fixed that. So we should have 665. Now we've got 811. Um, what this blank is actually different from this one. This one is totally empty. This one we replaced with double quotes. It's now treating that as text information. Uh, that's difficult. Okay. So there are other functions that we could use to be able to get that. Um, but I'd have to go and search in their other function stuff to find it. You'll notice the numbers are different. Some people don't answer questions. That's a quality problem. There's missing data. But with salary, I've got more blanks. Um, it's a harder question. How much do you expect to earn? Uh, for many of you, you might have sort of scratched your head. I haven't thought about that before. Uh, let's just skip it. I don't know what to put down. So that may be the grounds why about 50 students didn't tell us what they expected to earn. But gender, is that because you're neither male nor female that you don't want to categorize yourself? That could be the case. And back then on this survey, you only had those two options. Today, generally on surveys, you've got at least a uh, other category or uh, that you may be allowed to classify as non-binary or other types of things, or you are given the option you don't want to say. So we can actually get people to respond instead of leaving it blank. That parental education though, let's look at it. Um, maybe you don't know, 668, hmm, that's strange. That how about language at home? That would, you know, maybe you don't know that your parents' education, so you just left it blank. What about language spoken at home? That's 666. Come on, you know that, don't you? Well, the these were at the end of the survey. And it was a very long survey. There were over a hundred questions. So probably some people gave up and they stopped answering. That's and if you look at all the questions you'll find as you work through the survey, the later it is, the lower the response rate. So these counts give us some idea of some of the problems we may have in data quality in terms of missing observations. That we've already seen data quality with some numbers because they're too high or too low. But the other we'd like to do, we've um, you might like to know uh, averages. So what is the average salary? Let's click on that one. And it'll give me the average for those that gave me an answer. It'll ignore the blanks. They gave me a zero though, it'll be included in this. So the average is almost $53,000. If you're concerned about crazy numbers, we can fix that. We could go up here. We could go to number filters. We could say, hmm. so you might think the low end, maybe 20,000. Something below 20,000 is probably not valid. And on the high end, what would you pick? I don't know, say 120. Not sure. You can pick whatever number you want. That 
and view that as being an outlier. There's probably an error. Like this one, I wouldn't think is an error. It may be unrealistic, but it's not an error because it's probably not 12,000. Because if it was 12,000 and they put an extra zero in, I would have thrown it out. So let's click OK here. Ah, changes my average. It's the crazy high numbers may offset some of the crazy low ones, but uh, they are pulling things upwards. So the average now is around 51,480. Okay. Um, is it the same for different groups? What if I just look at those that are females? Okay. I've left the blanks out. Oh, they're at four, 48,000. They're about $3,000 less. So I guess the males are more. Yeah, a little bit, 54,003. So there, remember the average was around 51. So the males are about $3,000 above average, females about $3,000 low. What about that little group of people that wouldn't tell me their gender? Look at the blanks, I'm curious. Ooh, they're much higher. They're, they're strange. There's 110 of them. So um, it's curious. There are some that are on the low end, but I've taken out the very low people. So that's curious. Um, let me go back and look at all of them. Here we go. I'm at 51.4. And let me go over here and look at programs that I would expect art students would have the lowest expectations. They're at 47.7, that's low. There's, uh, how many art students? We've got 241 telling me they're average. So, do, 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 do. yeah, I've got 241 art students. That, uh, what about, business students. No, they're above average. They're a little bit, 52.4, and we got a lot of them. Okay, what about our science students? Um, 57, Ooh, they're very high expectations. That's surprising. If, if I could cut out engineering, it's probably lower. I can't remember what code is engineering but actually all the other science students, other than computing science and engineering, uh, science salaries are generally no higher than art salaries. And let's look at the ones that didn't tell us or the ones that told us crazy things. Mm, they're a bit on the low side, aren't they? Mm, okay, they're a little bit below. Is that blanks or is that the invalid ones? There aren't that many, there's only 83 of them. Mm, yeah, they're all about the same. It hasn't changed much. So we can do all kinds of different things and do comparisons across these different groups. We could look at male and female art students and business students. We have lots of choices there that we could be exploring. Let me go back and get my slides back. There we go. So this total row I've got, I've just gone through and that, oh, I did it. Hey, I did the same thing as in my slides. Okay. So the, um, I explored different sorts of things here that part of the problem, you know, things that we're learning from this is that there could be coding errors and there could be survey fatigue that you're going to get that uh, we could have looked at minimum and maximum there instead of sorting the data. I like to sort numbers to look at it, to see if it's just one person that's super low or one person that's super high. Do we have a whole bunch of them? And in our case, yes, we do. That So we looked at students that were between 20 and 120, and we've looked at the different average salaries in the different groups. But it's traditional to go and look at more, not just 
individual values, but try to summarize and summarize it in some consistent fashion. So Excel can do that. There is a tool pack you can add in to Excel. If you did want one, you use the solver tool pack and uh, the solver add-in. So we've got a statistics add-in. Uh, so we could go through on how to do that. You generally have to go up to the home tab, at least on a Windows machine. And you will find that the um, there's a whole bunch of different sorts of things that you can pull up. And among them are these different options down at the bottom. And if you click on it, you can bring up in the list Excel add-ins. I don't know what all this junk is in the middle of my screen, but at the bottom it says manage Excel add-ins. Click on that. If I do, I'm going to get the analysis tool pack add-in. And we'll get we'll do that in a minute. Okay. That so what do I mean? We're going to look at what are called histograms. And histograms are charts of a thing called a frequency distribution. So what's a frequency distribution? A frequency distribution is like taking a categorical variable or taking numbers and creating categories with the numbers and counting up how many fit into each category. What's the frequency? So we did that in terms of grouping salary expectations. And I can't remember if we set our limit at 100,000 or 120. In my slides, I've got it at 100. We can change that if we want. And so we had different sorts of ranges of values. And we use this, we used it for our approximate uh, VLOOKUP. And so we recategorized the different salary values into groups. Well, manually, I've gone and counted this, not actually by hand. I used a trick to do it, but counted how many fit into each of these groups. Okay. So I'd see that most of them, the biggest group was in the medium, 50 to 60. I had 292. But on the very low, I had quite a few, 32. And on the very, the unrealistic, I had 43 which is quite a few, it's about 5% of the sample that I had, that the generally with frequency distributions, we don't give these text descriptions. We just summarize the numbers and how many fit into the different ones. So Excel can do that for us, okay? That we're not gonna go and do it by hand. So we have to, in Excel, tell it what the grouping is going to be. be. And so I've got in groups of 20,000 and then more at the end. Why did I pick that group? Why not something else? Why not 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and all the way up from 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, and so on? Maybe I could do. 0 to 17, 17 to 34, 34 to 51. Still going in equal size groups, but increments of 17,000. Why? Uh, I could go 0 to 10, 10 to 50, 50 to 1,000. Whoa, what are you doing? Uh, I could have all kinds of different size groups. What's the best approach to doing this type of thing? So we'd like it to be concise. We'd like it to be informative. How do we do that type of thing? Well, to be concise, you can't have too many groups. So don't have 50 groups or 100 groups, something small, maybe 10, maybe 20. That if you go too small, like having only three groups, you lose too much information. If I had salary expectations that were 0 to 50,000, 50 to 100 and above 100,000, it's no, not enough detail. So it's a trade-off. Okay. If you've got lots of data, you can generally have more groups. If you only have a little bit of data, your groups tend to be bigger because you don't want to have only one or two or three or five in a group. You'd like to have your groups to have quite a few. That the groups have got to be very clear, not no ambiguity 
if you go back here, you'll see it went to 19,999 and the next one started at 20. I don't go zero to 20, then 20 to 40, because many people told me exactly 20. Where does that 20 go? Um, in the very low group or in the low group? I know they're right on the edge, but I've got to put them somewhere. So your groups have got to be unambiguous in that regard. It should include all the data. Now, my group, my last one, went 100,000 or 120,000 and above. So it included everybody, even the crazy numbers at the top end. So I've got to include all the data. Uh, I might subsequently pull out outliers, but initially include them in your summary. Use nice numbers, like before I was suggesting using group increments of 17,000. No, that's crazy. That we like convenient figures, like increments of 20,000 or increments of 10,000 or increments of 25,000. Nice numbers. That um, most of us like groups that are of equal size. So I went in steps of 20 or you might go in steps of 10 or something like that. But if you've got a group that's bigger than all the others, you would expect it to have more values in it, which makes it confusing to look at. So equal size is good. But your first group and your last group may be below 20,000, or maybe it's below 30,000 or 40,000. So that bottom tail and the top group, like I had a, above 100,000. 100,000 or above, uh, because I don't want to have a whole bunch of little tiny groups at the top. Okay. Hit in Excel, they call these groups bins. Okay. And you have to define the bins. And it's sort of like in a lookup table where you had to define your grouping in a lookup table. But it's different from VLOOKUP. With VLOOKUP, it wanted to know the ending point or the starting point for each group. Like I wanted to start at zero and start at 20 and start at 40,000 and 60,000 and so on. Well, with the bins, <laughs> um, it wants to know where the bins end. So if you put in zero, it'll actually only give you the values of exactly zero. <laughs> um, so my first group, instead of it starting at zero and the next one starting at 20, I'm going to end up defining my first group as ending at 20 and ending at 40 and ending at 60. Um, so it treats that edge a little bit differently. Uh, so I'm going to create these salary bins. So remember my groups that I had, I started at 0, 20, 40, 60. Um, I'm going to go in groups of 10,000 for this chart. Um, and I'm going to end at 10, at 20, at 30, 40, 50, 60, and I'll go up to 120. And then the last group is going to be above 120. Okay. So let's go and do that in Excel. Now I'm going to get out of this thing again. Exit full screen. Ah, there I go. That's what I wanted before. So let me go. I hope I'm recording all right. My picture in Zoom doesn't look very good. So I'm going to go up here to, oh, I shouldn't go to home. I go to file, excuse me. Go to file, go to options. I said home before, didn't I? I'm going to go to add-ins. Come on, sometimes slow. There it is. Then I'm going to go down to Excel, add-ins. I have to hit go. I've already got analysis tool pack installed. Okay, so, and I got solver. So I'm done, okay, it's all done, it's all in there. Okay, you may have to do it differently. So now I'm gonna go up to the data tab, top, or I was in, played with design tab. If I go to the data tab, I should find over here on the right, and if you use solver before, you'll find the same place you'd probably find solver. You click on data analysis. I'm going to click on this one and it's going to click. Okay. So it wants to know the input range. So I'm going to look at salary. I'm going to tell it over here. Actually, I'm going to, let me 
get out of here for a second. I've still got filters on. It actually doesn't matter that I've got filters on, but I shouldn't have them on. Okay, let's get them out of here. Uh, let me clear that filter. Any others you can see? Sorted age, but it's not a filter. And I don't have any others. Okay. So let's go back to my data analysis. I'm going to go to histogram. It wants input range. Okay. So that's all the salary figures. And so that's from L, it's in column L2. And I'm just going to type it in. Oops, excuse me. And it's going to go from L2 to L812. I just remember that's the last row that I've got data in it. Okay. If you wanted to, you could have gone and just selected it. So, and you can go down to the bottom. Now it's going to stop at blanks here. I've got to keep going down here. Or some of the shortcut keys for getting to the bottom just aren't going to work for me because most of the time with shortcuts they stop when it hits a blank and I've got blanks. Oops, I went too far. There I am. Now, as you can see, my last row of real data is 812. Don't go to 813 because that's just an average. Okay, now it wants to know where to find the bins. I put my bins in my lookup table and I already made them up, okay? So here are a whole bunch of bins. Now I've just grabbed only the numbers in both cases, okay? So I have no labels that, uh, we'll do it in a minute. I'll have labels in there, okay? And I want chart notebook. Make sure you click off charts. Don't worry about the others and click OK. See if it worked. Sometimes it doesn't. There, it worked this time. So in the first bin, it's these are under a 10,000. I've got 22 that I've got. The last bin, you'll notice it says more. These are ones that are over 120,000. I've got nine of them here. Let me go back and I put it into a new sheet. Let me go back here again. And I'm going to do this again, histogram. And this time, I'm going to go right to the very top. So I grab the whole column. And so maybe I do it this way. Oops. Here we go. No, it's not grabbing it. Let me grab it with the label, OK? I've got a label in here. Now with this one, notice it's in that lookup table, it's grabbed it. Let me grab this with the label in it. Okay. And now I've got to tell it it's labels. Let's see if it works properly. Oh dear. Uh, It wasn't happy, but notice it now calls them salary bins because the label at the top of salary was salary bins. What if I went back here and I did it again and I didn't tell labels, what's it gonna do to me now? Ah, I've got non-numeric data. It doesn't like the words and so words are not numbers. So it's expecting only numbers being present, okay? So I've got to go back and fix that. Let me, uh, so I've got to click on labels. Let me try one other things for you. Let me go and do it. Do, 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 do. Oh, so let me. And I'm just going to pick the numbers, okay? And I'm going to tell it it has labels. <laughs> so now I've told it it has labels, but there aren't any labels. What's it going to do to me now? 
how it works. It now calls it 10,000 and there's no longer a group that is from zero to 10,000. It's now the first group is zero to 20,000 because it took the 10,000 as being the label for that group, okay? And it messes up a whole bunch of different things. It's, um, what happened to my, did I not grab the 120 properly? Because it ended the last group in the wrong place. But you can see I can do make different types of mistakes with this function in terms of how I grab it. Let me go back to my slides here. Oops, that's not what I wanted to be. There we are. So I could do all of those things. And I get this sort of chart that comes out that um, some people like to get rid of the gaps between the bars. I like the bars. This is a column chart in Excel. And a column chart in Excel, usually they put gaps in between. Uh, you'll find in a statistics course, they'll say, no, 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 you can't have gaps. Uh, you can get rid of them, okay? And I'll show you how to do that in a second by changing the thing on the gaps. So this is more traditionally what you see as a histogram. This is what the, they call this chart. Watch out, this little bump that's at the end of my chart it says more. Some people think it's just that little group has a little bump, but remember this actually goes up to 650,000. So it's not just a simple little bump that we've got here at the end. That um, if I was to go and do this type of thing, on subgroups, if I want to compare business students, art students, science students, I can't do it. Remember before I took my filter off, even if I hadn't taken the filter off on salary and, and what program students were in, it would still grab all the values because I told it from row one to row 812. I can't do it easily with um, arts, business and science. I could sort my data and then tell it what range the business students are in and then do it that way and what range the art students are in and create a histogram that way and so on. Um, you can do it, it's just more challenging. Uh, I tend to go, and this is just for illustration, what I did was I filtered on all of the uh, art students copied it, pasted it into a new worksheet. I went and did it for the business students, pasted it into my sheet. I did it for the science students, pasted it into my sheet. Then I went and I created a histogram and frequency distribution for that art column. So I selected that column, created a histogram. Then I selected the business column, I created a histogram. I selected the science one, created a histogram. And instead of putting them on new sheets, I had it paste them, each of them into the same sheet. So I could look at all three of them. It's hard to. Um, there are gaps and bumpiness. It gets bumpier as you get smaller samples. So that's a problem. That um, I also run into problems because there are frequencies that I've got. You'll notice that I've got you know, very, very few science students in each of these different categories. And that's because I got fewer science students. If you're comparing groups, you should be looking at what we call relative frequencies, okay? That they're different size programs. If I had taken this and made it into, I, I can create a, a chart in Excel called a clustered column chart and take those three groups of data and plot it, but you'll see the gray for the science students is very low compared to the uh, art students and the business students. Arts are in blue, business are in orange. And it's just because there aren't that many science students. So there are many fewer science students. So in practice, what we have to do is create what we call relative frequencies. What percentage of arts, business, or science students are in the different categories. So now I've got, I can't see this because I'm, can I scroll up a little higher? That with the art students, if I'm looking at the 50,000 group, say, 
18% of art students are in the uh, group that's 40 to 50. And 22% of the business students are in that group, but 26 of the science students are in that group. So this is the group I'm looking at right about here. And that it's common standard units of measurement, they're all adding up to 100%. It's like if I add 100 arts, 100 business, 100 science students, it makes it much easier to do the comparisons. I can do uh, that generalization better. Generally, I clean up my charts and you'll be seeing this as we go along that I get rid of the decimals when I'm showing percentages. It makes it easier to look at, but we'll focus on that a little bit later. So what do the charts show us? It gives us an idea of where most of the values are. What are the small values? What are the large values? Are they really spread out? Or are they bunched together? Are there some stragglers, that type of thing? So you'd see, here's the art students, and they tend to be shifted somewhat compared to the science students. Science students are more over to the right. Business students are more over to the left. That, but nonetheless, most of them are in this middle 30, 40,000 up to maybe 70,000. Really small numbers are down with 100 and or 10,000, 20,000, big numbers are about 80,000. So I get a sense of middle, high, low. And are they bunched? What's this shape sort of look like? Okay. And shapes that you get, you probably heard of a bell curve. That's called a normal distribution. And it's the left side looks like the right side. So look at ours, is that the case? Ours go up and down, but you know, look at, it goes up, it goes down, but it trickles along on the right here. It's got stragglers that way. Same with the other guys, that they're, we'd say they're a little bit skewed. And generally in financial data, we get this, you know, some people at the bottom end, uh, but you can't go below zero. But on the top end, they could go really, really, really big. So if you look at, at real salary data, income data, it's skewed as a long tail. They're the super rich out here. And if you look at their house prices, yeah, same way, super rich. Car prices, same way. You know that there's only so low you can go in terms of the price of car, but on the top end, they can keep going forever. Sometimes it goes the other way. We see this with grade data that most students are getting grades above 50% but you can't get above 100%. So we get bunching at the top end and then a long tail at the bottom end. We do get some students down at five and 10%. Generally, it's because they've dropped out. They haven't completed a lot of material. Uh, it's unusual, there's something wrong taking place there, but you do get them at that bottom, bottom end. So sometimes we get skewed data that has long skew to the left or to the right. Uh, the, so of the sorts of things we tried to go through today, it's try to look at how we can summarize our data, what's small, what's large, what's middle. Uh, are they all spread out, clustered together, widely spread? That total row helps us generally to find averages and find the middle, that we can use filters to look at subgroups, that type of way. It's some of the tools we've used though are a bit clumsy. That next week we'll look into more flexible tools within that. That um, histogram is a nice way of getting a broad picture chart. The table isn't used that much. It's more the picture. But next I'd like to go um, and look at simple summary measures like average, but there are other measures of low or high, what alternatives do we have for doing that rather than maximum and minimum? How spread out is our data? How do you measure spread? That uh, Are there ways of being able to measure how spread it, out it is? Are there other features of the data set that we may need to measure? And that's basically where we are. So that brings us to the end. So we're finished our presentation here and we're
Should we finish our, how do I end this? Yeah, it's not letting me end. Anyway, I'll find a way to end this. <laughs> Zoom, how do you end recording? I think it's something like Alt R. I'll end it. Mm-hmm.